serve as Dean of the International Center at the University. And I am uh, professionally trained as an agronomist and plant geneticist and plant breeder uh, by way of introduction. And I will introduce the panelists in just a moment. Uh, this is the first of three conversations which have been put together uh, for this symposium. Uh, we are uh, going to be very serious about these being conversations. They are meant to draw you into the conversation, to draw you into the discussion with the uh, members of the panel, but with all of you as, as part of the extended panel in a sense. And so we're going to begin with some, some short uh, opening conversations or s opening statements to get the conversation started, uh, offering perspectives on our theme. And the theme of this first conversation is improving future food and nutritional security. And I'll have something to say in a moment to set the stage and then we'll hear from the panelists and then open the, uh, the floor for uh, general contributions to the conversation. Let me introduce the panelists quickly, beginning on my right, your left, uh, Victoria Quinn. Dr. Quinn is the Senior Vice President for Programs at the Helen Keller International uh, in Washington, D.C., and she is a nutritionist by profession and training. So welcome, Victoria. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, sitting immediately to my right is uh, Tim Wheeler. Uh, Dr. Wheeler is Deputy Chief Scientist for the Department for International Development, uh, DFID, in the UK. And he is Director of Research and Evidence. What's the next word? I can't read my writing. DFID? <laughs> and, okay. And, and for Research and Evidence uh, Department in DFID. And he is also a Professor of Crop Science at the University of Reading. Uh, in the UK. So thank you, uh, Dr. Wheeler. Uh, to my left uh, is Dr. Wolfgang Kosten. Wolfgang is also a member of the Board of Directors of AVRDC. He is, uh, in his professional role, a Senior Program Manager with the Advisory Service on Agricultural Research and Development for GIZ in Germany. Uh, he is chair of the audit committee of the board here at the uh, at the ABRDC, and we uh, we welcome uh, Dr. Custom as well. And then the fourth member of our panel is uh, Dr. Victor Afari Sefa. Uh, Dr. Afari Sefa is the ABRDC theme leader for consumption. Theme consumption, one of the four broad themes of the research agenda here at ABRDC. Uh, Victor is based in Tanzania. He is a Chilean, excuse me, Ghanaian by birth, an agricultural economist with significant monitoring and evaluation expertise. And we welcome you, Victor, as well. Okay, I'm going to try something I've never done before, which is to read a script on an iPad. I prefer to work off of paper. And, <laughs> uh, so you can guess that I was born and grew up in the 50s, uh, not in the 70s. Uh, I have a, a, an opening statement here which is intended to set the stage for our theme, the theme being uh, improving future food and nutritional security. That is the theme of this uh, conversation. And I see I've already hit the wrong button here. <laughs> I was actually reading something from that I had written to Dr. John Yoey, who's the director of one of our CRISPs, and I thought, what does this say? Um, our topic this morning is twofold, as is clear from the title of this conversation. How do we improve future food security and also improve future nutritional security? Both are essential, but by implication, certainly in the title, the two are not the same nor does security in one, say food security, necessarily mean that security in the other, nutritional security, uh, has been attained. We have as a consequence a dilemma, and that issue is what we will consider this morning. How do we simultaneously improve future food security and concurrently also assure future nutritional security? Let me provide some background to set the stage. In 1996, at the World Food Summit, food security was described thus. Food security exists when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food 
to permit them to maintain a healthy and an active life. Now note the nuances in this definition. Food security exists when all people have enough food, that is sufficient caloric intake, when that food is sanitary and safe to eat, and when it is nutritious, that is possessing the optimum array of fiber, vitamins, macro and micronutrients for a balanced and healthy diet. So you might ask, what is the fuss about food and nutritional security? Are we simply parsing words here and making the situation more complex than it really needs to be? Isn't the World Food Summit definition good enough? Apparently not. Since at about the same time that the food security definition was crafted in 1996, the term nutritional security also emerged in the dialogue about food insecurity. This new term, nutritional security, makes clear the distinction between enough food and enough of the right kind of food. Sufficient food and the right kind of food combine to provide true and genuine food security. But even then, there are other important factors at play in this debate. Nutritional security focuses on household and individual patterns in, of consumption rather than at the population level. Uh, nutritional security implies something about how well the body metabolizes the array of food consumed, consumed and the con contribution of the array of food items consumed to the support of normal growth and body maintenance. When we talk about balanced diets at the household and individual level, that's a big part of the equation when we are thinking about nutritional security. And then there are other important non-food issues that enter the conversation. Proper sanitation obviously is critical to food and nutritional security. And so too are an array of social issues such as food preferences and food choice, the economics of food availability, access to adequate primary health care, the age and gender of the individual, the occurrence of infectious diseases that interfere with food and nutrient absorption, just to name a few of the complexities that we confront when we talk about nutritional uh, security. And we need to add to this uh, issues of the uncertainty of climate change, as Professor Lee pointed out, and the potential of climate change to impact uh, food systems around the world. Uh, these insights, I think, are important because they advance the discussion. It's clear that a complex of biological, economic, environmental, health, and social issues must be considered in a package in order to reach the goal of food and nutritional security. Now let's talk for a moment about agriculture and its role in food and nutritional security. After all, we are here this week to celebrate the contributions of agricultural research to food and nutritional security and to take a forward look at future needs and possibilities in this arena. Where exactly does agriculture fit into the complexity that I've outlined? What is our role as agriculturalists? And where do vegetables belong in this debate? It turns out that during the past 50 years or so, since the beginnings of the Green Revolution, the focus in the food security discussion has generally been on food sufficiency, that is, on production of enough to eat, and that's been generally interpreted to be enough calories. In a practical sense, this has meant that the principal role of agricultural science has been the improvement of staple food crops, commodities like wheat, rice, maize, cassavas, and we must admit that dramatic production gains have been made without a doubt. But we all understand that staple crops are largely a source of energy, calories, leaving consumers, the presumed beneficiaries of these research contributions, still vulnerable to food insecurity simply because of continuing nutritional inadequacies resulting from sole reliance on the consumption of these uh, starchy commodities. Nutritional security is and can only be based on dietary diversity. No single food item can provide the array of nutritional factors necessary for true food security, for genuine nutritional security. 
which brings us to vegetables. The solution to a future characterized by food and nutritional security must reach well beyond staple food crops. Concrete actions to ensure both enough food and enough of the right kinds of food must be at the core of our efforts as agricultural research scientists. And this requires a new mindset by those of us who are agricultural professionals. Vegetables and of course other sorts of food items, but for our context, vegetables must and will be part of the solution. Dietary diversity, to which vegetables make essential contributions, is critical to attaining the goal of nutritional security. Eat your vegetables is not simply something that parents say to their children. Incorporating vegetables into diets provides one key to a future defined by both food and nutritional security. And we in the vegetable research community have a substantial role to play in this uh, future. Even so, we must continue to be cognizant of the larger issues informing any enduring solution to food and nutritional security. The myriad of social, economic, environmental, health, gender, age, and biological factors that are all at play. Vegetables are clearly part of the answer, but certainly not the only part but I would assert that they are a critical component. So although everyone on this uh, panel and in the audience today, I'm sure, will probably agree that the multiple and interconnected aspects of food and nutritional security have not received the attention they deserve, the question remains and the question we'll be addressing is as follows. How do we in this room and our colleagues beyond this room contribute to global efforts both to feed the world and also to nourish the world? How can we be assured that our interventions are sensitive to the imperatives of both food security and nutritional security, understanding that food security and nutrition security are not the same? So that lays the framework for what I'd like for us to discuss over the next uh, uh, hour and 15 minutes. And I'm going to begin by asking each of our panelists to contribute to this discussion, and then we'll open it to a larger discussion uh, with uh, all of those present in the room. So, Victoria, can we start with you? Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? I'm the farthest from the microphone. Very good. Very good loud voice as well. First, I wanted to say thank you very much to Dino and the AVRDC team for inviting me to Taiwan um, to represent Helen Keller International. It's a real honor to be here, a real pleasure. We've had, dare I say, to a vegetable group, a very fruitful collaboration uh, that stems back into, I believe, 1990 in Asia. And we continue this collaboration today to uh, this present time in Africa with some new initiatives. <clears throat> in particular, we've been working together on the Helen Keller International's Homestead Food Production Program. So I'll touch on that in some of my opening remarks. Um, HKI, we use proven evidence-based interventions to prevent blindness and also to improve nutrition. And one of our uh, key interventions is homestead food production. And this is uh, increasing the year-round production of micronutrient-rich foods, either vegetables, fruits, or animal, animal source foods, uh, targeting uh, vulnerable households and communities, particularly women farmers. Uh, with uh, using local varieties and uh, traditional techniques with the purpose of improving their nutritional status, particularly micronutrient um, status. We have some results to date, and I'll touch on those in a few minutes. Uh, but just to say this is an evolving process. We're always improving the program. Uh, it's far from perfect. We've just recently added a stronger nutrition education component um, to, uh, to underpin our behavior change aspects of, of that model. But before talking about sort of the bigger picture that we've been brought here today for the panel, I just wanted to remind us why we're here today. The situation of undernutrition is really dire. Here we are in 2013. We still have 165 million children who are stunted. Uh, under five deaths, at least 45% of them can be linked to malnutrition. We also know that we have to reach children during the first thousand days from conception to their second birthday. So we now scientifically know about this window of opportunity. 
So in terms of uh, agricultural development initiatives and human nutrition, we were asked by David to sort of think whether it's a bleak situation or a hopeful situation. I have five points to make. My first point is, in fact, this discussion is not new. I'm not that old, but I do know in 1935, they were discussing about the marriage between agriculture and health, or between agriculture and nutrition, at the League of Nations. And they said it was a new flame had been lit that would never be blown out. Well, neither was the marriage consummated, but the flame was blown, <laughs> blown out a few times. And in the, the decades that followed, in fact, we saw a reemergence, a cyclical sort of reemergence of the discussion of agriculture and nutrition with multi-sectoral nutrition planning in the 70s. And then later in the 1980s with structural adjustment and some of the drought crises that we had in the Horn of Africa where, as David mentioned, we began to speak about the term food security and food and nutrition security. But each time we tended then to forget about it until the 2008 food crisis. And here we are today speaking of the same issues. I'd like to refer back to the marvelous uh, discussion by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lee in the, just a few minutes ago. It's hard to follow a Nobel laureate. I think we all feel rather diminished in that regard. But uh, we have a problem in the way we're being trained. We're monkeys in our cages with our bananas. And this has led to this development amnesia where we forget about these critical issues until the next crisis comes along and we, we take up um, the issues again, this being agriculture and nutrition. Second point I would like to make is clear that increasing food production is not enough to improve nutrition. But we keep forgetting even this. When the 2008 food crisis came up, the initial UN documents that were produced talked about only producing more food. There was no mention of the quality of the food or for nutritional outcomes. But yet, in 1990, UNICEF came out with a wonderful framework to view this very complex situation that David outlined, very complex situation. But UNICEF said, we need food, quantity, and quality, household food security. That's one prerequisite. <clears throat> we need adequate care of women and children, which means dietary practices, nutritional practices, the situation of women. And we need adequate health and sanitation and hygiene. So we need food care and health if we are to get nutritional outcomes, whether it be an agricultural program or an education program or even a health program. But we keep forgetting about this as well. And again, it's part of, I think, the, the training that we've uh, received as scientists. We focus on the scientific discovery or delivery, but we forget about the history of our science and how to apply it. The third point I'd like to make is that we're at a very unique point in history today. Uh, the 2008 food crisis came at a point in time when more empirical evidence was released by the Lancet Journal on what we can do to actually improve nutrition. And we now have a, 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 a golden moment in time in nutrition, the major global scaling up nutrition initiative. We've had nutrition for growth conferences. We have commitments from, from over 40 countries that we will use everything within the country's means to tackle under nutrition. So let's look at the role of agriculture in tackling nutrition. So what do we know? What is the evidence? Well, certainly we've had a very scanty evidence to date. Marie Ruel has produced a paper in The Lancet from just past June where she looked at two types of programs. And she looked particularly at RCT, uh, uh, randomized control trials. And she found that the first type of program, biofortification, there is adequate evidence of efficacy and effectiveness in improving vitamin A deficiency. This is with orange flesh sweet potato. The second type of program concerning homestead food production is much less evidence. Though we do have evidence that um, production is increased, consumption and dietary diversity is increased, income is increased, including under the control of women. And where we're weak is the evidence on the impact on nutrition. There is some evidence showing vitamin A deficiency is improved and anemia is improved, but nothing yet on growth. Some of HKI's programs would be involved in, in the meta-analysis that Ruel and her colleagues undertook. So why is this the case? Is it that agriculture doesn't improve nutrition? Well, I don't think so, but still we, the, we still need to document much better, but there have been very poorly designed programs. We didn't have the food, the care, and the health components. So the programs have been poorly designed. The monitoring and evaluation systems have been very weak. There have not been adequately, robustly designed um, 
uh, systems or we have control groups, so that's been another problem. The wrong age groups were targeted. Kids were targeted when it was too late, it was beyond the thousand day opportunity. And we have programs that are of simply too short a duration to show any impact. But we did know the role of women is key. And empowering women in terms of their knowledge of agricultural and nutrition practices and their control over decision making and income does help in terms of nutritional outcomes. The fourth point I'd like to make at this uh, stage is what do we do about this evidence gap? And there is an interesting discussion that I think is beginning to emerge now. Different schools of thought, one group saying that we need randomized control trials, uh, we need more robust data. Uh, Gruel in her paper from The Lancet suggests this, though she recognizes that agricultural programs are very complex. RCTs are very complex, uh, difficult to do under such circumstances. Here we have another a school of thought, a pair of history of Anderson in the same um, volume of The Lancet actually said, are RCTs, are we raising the bar too high? Don't we have enough data on the food security impacts and the dietary diversity impacts? So we need to watch that space. It will be an interesting discussion. In terms of, um, I have uh, two more points. The fifth point is, in light of the lack of evidence, what can we do now to improve the uh, nutritional impact of agricultural programs? Certainly, we can improve the design so we could do touch on the food, the care, and the health. We do target children during the first thousand days, or the mothers, even before they're pregnant. That we have explicit nutrition goals in these agricultural projects without nutrition goals in the monitoring and evaluation systems. That they're not measured, it won't get done, we know that. And that we adequately designed uh, to uh, strengthen the situation of women do no harm to ensure that these programs actually empower them in terms of their knowledge and their control over resources and decision making. So my last and final point is sort of relates to what um, uh, Dr. Lee was saying earlier in terms of the politics. So my point so far has been looking at these, what Pair Prince of Anderson has said are smaller projects in terms of homestead food production. And he says, let's look bigger. Let's look at the entirety of the system in a country and what is driving forth food policy. Let's get into the muddle of politics and the political economy. Currently now we're producing cheap calories but very expensive micronutrients. If governments can commit to nutrition being a goal that they're committing to, what are the policy levers that can be employed using interventions, uh, um, uh, using various uh, regulations, using education, to actually increase the productivity of micronutrient-rich vegetables, fruits, and other <coughs> Decrease their price and increase their consumption. So all of this to say is, it's not just the science, but it's the politics that we have to get involved in. And we have to look at this bigger picture without doing so. And if we only look at some of the, the smaller programs, and I don't mean to diminish their importance, but if, if we don't look at the entirety of the political economy, I think we'll be missing quite a big part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Let me call on Tim Wheeler. Good, thank you, uh, David. And like Victoria, I'd like to start by thanking Dino and the chair of the board at the RDC for giving me the opportunity to come here today and, and, and join in this discussion. Um, also, like Victoria, I have five points. I don't know whether I'm going to set a trend here. Hopefully, they're different. Luckily, they are. Um, I thought I'd step back and take a sort of a big picture look at this. And I guess my starting point is um, from where I sit, research and evidence and the community that generates evidence sits within a wider policy environment. And the point that I'd like to make is actually the coming together of food security and nutrition security <coughs> at a policy level at the moment looks really good and I think will provide a massive incentive for those that are generating new evidence uh, and undertaking new, new research that brings together these two aspects. So it's a little bit on the how to improve um, future food and nutrition security, but, but actually stepping it up um, to, to some, of the, uh, some, some of the policy priorities going forwards. I, I will come down to some research things at the end, but let me start with point number one. Um, we will all, I think, be aware in this audience um, of the work that is being done by the high-level panel of eminent persons on the post-2015 development agenda 
Uh, anyone from any development organization or anyone involved in development has been intrinsically linked with this effort uh, and will have read the report that came out this year that sets at least some guidelines as to what may or may not be goals or whatever the term is going to be used uh, beyond 2015. Uh, and these will guide the high-level policy and, and, and programs uh, from that time onwards. And so I think it is encouraging to see that goal five is to ensure food security and good nutrition, and the two are intrinsically linked at that very high level. Uh, number two, and Victoria sort of touched on this, um, I was uh, involved with DFID on the uh, Nutrition for Growth event that occurred in London July of this year and was a joint UK Brazil initiative. Um, lots of things came out of that from a policy angle. The Global Nutrition for Growth Compact was signed up to by 26 governments, 22 businesses, and a whole raft of international organizations and civil society organizations. Uh, that was fantastic. Of course, that's a form of words at a very high level, and it had some financial commitments that were pinned to it. Again, that will provide an enabling environment that brings together new nutrition activities, commitments, and interventions that would not have otherwise happened. Uh, one of those commitments was to produce an annual global report on nutrition uh, from the year 2014. Uh, the financial commitments exceeded $12 billion, and of course they now have to be uh, of, new, of new commitments that they now have to be delivered on. I think important for us here, or remain from the research and evidence uh, community, is that um, that event also established the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition to be co-chaired by John Bennington, the former chief scientist in the UK, and ex -president, uh, former president John Kufour from Ghana. It's a fantastic panel. Um, all of those that we asked to be on it accepted, so that's always a good sign. Um, and there's a, a high-quality secretariat that will now be driving forwards uh, global leadership for evidence in nutrition and agriculture for nutrition, and for investments in agriculture for nutrition, evidence and research uh, investments. So we look to see, I guess, for that, uh, for that panel to, to be delivering, but again, at the higher level, it's providing an incentive for pulling together the agricultural and nutrition communities, which is great. And from our own teams in, in DFID, we even got our own Prime Minister to mention an orange flesh sweet potato in his talk. Um, if you work for government, these things are important, and just that paragraph <laughs> was the cause of a whole floor bursting out in celebrations within our building. Um, <laughs> more, more seriously, I think it is, uh, it is always good at a high level to get these examples in, into these speeches, uh, even though it does take six months of work to do so. Um, <laughs> Uh, and things can change in the last 10 seconds. So, uh, point three, the Camp David G8 uh, Summit 2012, uh, where the US headed the, uh, the G8 for that year, uh, one commitment for that was for a global open data initiative for agriculture. The idea of that was that by making data open and accessible in a way that anyone can use it, we can encourage new uses of agricultural data, new uses of, of agricultural data for research, but also for commercialization, for the translation of agricultural data into practice. Uh, this turned into a, a UK-US initiative as we tried to implement this commitment. Um, and this year, um, in a couple of weeks' time, we'll be launching um, the, the formal uh, network that is now going to be called, and notice the difference uh, here, Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition. Um, that, uh, as head of the UK team, was our, was our contribution to that. So, again, it's time together uh, the nutrition and the agriculture data community here. So those who are producing data, making it available uh, for those to generate new interventions, new, new evidence, and, and new initiatives. So that's really encouraging. Moving down into some of the sort of higher level research um, um, priorities, and uh, as my point four, I think the IFRI Delhi conference that I'm, I'm sure many of you were here were, were at, and Dino gave an excellent talk, I remember that well. Um, but that was an important step in terms of um, incentivizing the research community, and the follow on steps that IFRI uh, have taken after that, I think, have, have, have worked very well. Uh, it was noticeable for those who were there, actually, that of those three communities that helped nutrition and the agriculture community, there were very few from that category number one. Uh, however, all the 
were taught there was about the joining together of the different disciplines in new and exciting ways. So I think that was important. Uh, and the conference next year that's coming up in Addis in May, that we are just uh, starting to set up, will hopefully be a step further down the line of incentivizing these research communities in, in new and different ways. So, so that's great. If I can kind of finish on my, my fifth question with, with a tie in actually to climate change. Uh, and I guess I would have to do this. I, I started working on climate change just after the first IPCC report was published in 1991, where you could fit the entire global community uh, within this audience and probably segment it into this tiny corner. <laughs> in hindsight, that seems a good career choice, but you never know at the time. Um, myself and uh, Joachim von Braun, former DG at IPRI, uh, took some time over the summer to, to actually look at all the evidence of the impacts of climate change on food security. But one of the things that we did, and we published this in, in, in Science, and, and you can have a look yourself, one of the things we did was we looked at all of the literature over that time, and we categorized it according to those four pillars that we're all familiar with uh, in, in, in food security, production, access, utilization, <coughs> and stability. But we didn't cover the, the, the nutrition pillars that David mentioned. And it was fascinating to see how it panned out. 70% of all of the literature, all the scientific literature, was in that production box. 12% uh, was in access, 14% we put down to utilization, and only 4% to stability. In other words, there's a massive skewing of the science evidence base towards production in terms of the impact on climate change. And I think that's sort of uh, you know, a general pattern across this area. There is, there's always this return to the production questions, and there's some very good reasons for that. But I guess our um, priority as a research community is to kind of even out the balance of it try to take this wider dimension of support. Uh, and our suggestion uh, at the end of that paper was actually climate smart agriculture was probably only part, it wasn't necessary, but only part of the way of working towards a food system that was better adapted to climate change, and a more holistic view that picked up the wider dimensions of food security, and, and by implication nutrition security, uh, is probably the way forward. So I'll stop there, but, uh, thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much, Tim. Well, let me turn it out to you. Thank you, David, for giving me the floor. Good morning, everybody. Thank you to the management. It's a possibility to be today. It's been kind of David gave already a reflection about the international discussion on turning the topic. Discussion of the international right.
but this is great insight about my relation to vegetables. I would like to give you some thoughts about what the World Vegetable Center could do in future. I will need the policy level a little bit to talk about more about some basics. For instance, the positive effect of the availability of vegetables and fruits for low prices, they all get all year round easy. To the negative consequence that people don't understand the role of vegetables for a healthy diet, and unfortunately they are losing more and more respect for food and food production. There are serious estimations that in Germany around 40% of all food produced is wasted. There. So again, yeah, this is a horrible figure from my point of view, and unfortunately, these figures related to food losses are not significantly better in other European countries or in other so-called countries. Food loss is an issue we should deal with from my perspective. We can try to produce more, but we can try to consume more wisely. That's why we address in Germany this issue now as a very serious one. We should not allow ourselves to waste 40% of all food, which is really food consumable. So, second point. I believe that education is very important to achieve food security because as you that you rightly pointed out, the pure availability of food and quantity and quality is not sufficient to achieve food security. <coughs> Educate people in a way that they understand more about nutrition in general and the role about vegetables is specific for nutrition. The goal should be that they would like to nourish themselves in a healthy way. And the best way to start is with school kids. It's evident that people who know about interdependence of nutrition and health are healthier. What's the role of the public sector in this context? From my opinion, it's setting a legislation which guides food producers in the whole value chain in the direction that they produce high quality food. And the role of the private sector should be a commitment of food producers and food distributors to limit the sales of products which have a negative impact on them. It seems to be too easy to give the overall responsibility for nutrition to consumers, especially not in the case of children. And what should we do now in research? I mean, we should start endless discussions. I have only some thoughts. Public research is mainly focusing currently on vegetable production, small scale producers. So far, so good. But who wants to be until the end of his life a small farmer? Aren't we keeping them in poverty? But don't we need more research for large scale vegetable production in the public domain? I mean, in a way that we a sustainable agricultural industry. Especially if we are talking about vegetables, what's the role of urban and very urban vegetable production? This is a huge issue from my perspective. More and more people are living in cities now, and the, the potential to grow vegetables in cities is huge. Do we need more research on topic of vegetable gardens. Do they have a nutritional value only? I doubt it, as I already said. What is the contribution of vegetable gardens to <coughs> the preservation of local varieties? I personally believe that it is a private vegetable gardens uh, does a wonderful work, but uh, do a wonderful work to preserve local varieties in a more and more industrialized agriculture. The number of varieties is really limited, but if we think on future challenges, and we talked with Daniel talk this morning about all our enemies, I mean, if we want to fight against all our enemies, we need a certain variability in the genomes of different varieties. And that's why I can imagine that these uh, 
co-guardians have a more uh, a broader role, not, not only to nourish the family, which is producing this vegetable. So, what else? <coughs> it was, um, this morning, Professor Lee showed a lot of interesting pictures. And uh, at the end, he has shown two pictures of a photographer. His name is Peter Mansell.
So, um, yeah, food security in the past, maybe in the 70s, just like Victoria said, has was basically um, trying to provide um, calories, uh, so basically uh, staples uh, for individuals. And you know, we all know what happened in mass uh, uh, pro uh, programs uh, to produce basic staples and cereals and root crops in some other countries. And then at some point there was a discussion on the fact that uh, nutrition has to come up strongly in that. So um, there was then, the, of course, the dimension of bringing in nutritional security um, in addition to just the basic staples. So obviously um, it came on the issue on the um, addition of micronutrients. And of course there have been several different forms of it. It could be vegetables, um, normally broadly speaking dietary diversity which includes vegetables, includes uh, non timber and forest products, uh, also fruits, and then of course it could be supplementation through tablets or um, also um, the issue of biofortification, so trying to add some micronutrients to some of the um, basic staples like potato or cassava um, in various countries. And then in more recent times, there's been the issue of the fact that um, providing even both the macro and micronutrients alone is not sufficient, and that there's a need to include non-food factors. Uh, of course, I think um, Victoria again talked about it, and this includes um, the popular uh, acronym they call WASH, so that's uh, water, um, sanitation, and health, uh, and, and hygiene. And of course, there's also health in other areas that might issues also with uh, other social factors. Um, this was also quite uh, prominent uh, in the, uh, the recent science for, uh, forum that took place in Bonn. I think uh, some of us uh, here were, were at that uh, forum. And um, all these are, of course, uh, aimed at uh, trying to contribute to the Millennium Development Goals, so both for eradicating poverty and hunger, and also for uh, maternal uh, uh, so, uh, of course, the, the definition that uh, David uh, talked about, uh, trying to revise the definition of food security to encompass uh, all the four pillars, which is uh, accessibility, availability, utilization, and stability uh, of, of um, the access, which includes um, several other things like climate change, uh, you mentioned, and of course, and other environmental factors uh, and the sanitation and stuff like that. Now, this, of course, um, is a current thinking, and what it does is that it poses a kind of a methodological challenge in terms of, if, for example, I'm involved in the vegetable research and development, how do I attribute it to food and nutritional security? But then there are other food factors you know, that, that come into the equation. So in terms of that, uh, the issue is do we talk of an attribution to food and nutritional security, or even if uh, health is included, or do we talk of a contribution? Uh, of course, uh, if it's an uh, attribution or a direct impact, causal impact, that's say increased consumption of vegetables leads to uh, improved uh, nutrition and health, then of course uh, you need to come up with very robust methodological design, just like Victoria said, these days people are talking about a randomized control trial, it may apply in some circumstances, it may not apply. And of course, there are other issues like the ethics of it uh, in terms of uh, the fact that we are also talking about development. So if, for example, you want to say that some community, because of uh, experimental purposes, should not benefit from the package, and then right away, of course, you are also excluded. And, uh, if the purpose of the intervention is also for development, then of course, there are issues with that. Now, others have also said that, well, uh, you could look at uh, contribution you know, uh, of that intervention to uh, uh, the uh, overall goals, which is for the nutrition security in that instance. And the contribution, all that it looks at, it tries to look at um, some qualitative factors and also behavioral changes, what needs to be changed you know, in terms of intervention to lead to uh, a proxy uh, or causal effects or for example, increased consumption of vegetables to food and nutritional security. And uh, there are tools like outcome mapping and, and, and other uh, to be able to do uh, that kind of uh, analysis. 
So uh, obviously this poses a, a challenge, and, uh, and in terms of uh, um, the center, uh, which focuses basically on data, and some of the approaches is that we might want to uh, partner with other institutions, and a good example is Helen Keller in that case, who are involved in some of the clinical studies um, to look at the health um, indicators, whereas we could uh, look at the cultural indicators. Uh, so that will be um, one possibility to do that. Um, the other possibility may also be, uh, like I said, use some of the uh, qualitative uh, attributes to look at contribution, because I think it's not all the time um, that explicitly have to look at uh, uh, an attribution of an intervention to um, the uh, food and security, nutritional security um, discussion. So I think that uh, in all these, um, obviously the way forward, uh, no matter what the approach is, um, these days I think that one of the issues is to ensure that with all these complex interrelated um, uh, nutrition and health, um, one of the best starting points is to come up with a very clear conceptual framework and impact pathway as to what leads to what the end. So if you have a very clear impact pathway, then that allows you uh, to be able to go through carefully and see which kind of uh, approach will have to be used uh, to be able to uh, contribute to the discussion in terms of uh, evaluating uh, research and development intervention. So of course there's no blanket recommendation that this has been done, but I think the starting point is to carefully think of an impact pathway of, let's say, an X intervention is going to lead to this out. So I think I want to end my talk here. And uh, David Fern uh, as part of the discussion. Thank you very much. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you all for your contributions to the, uh, the launch of this conversation. Uh, it's noteworthy, as I've been sitting listening to all of you and also listening to Professor Lee before the coffee break, <coughs> that our approaches to solving the dilemma of, of food and nutritional security seem to be bifurcated into two broad areas. And all of you have touched on this. On the one hand, we need to think about research and the way we approach research to solve the dilemma. And the other side of it has to do with how do we articulate policies that will improve the environment for appropriate food and nutritional um, security. Those seem to be the, the two broad issues that have uh, emerged. And I thought your, your point, the methodological challenge, are part of what is both the problem and the solution. Uh, if we're going to have impact, we've got to think about methodology that will ensure that impact is uh, measurable and is, uh, it flows out of the work that we do. So let me sort of start the conversation by asking a question of the panel, then we'll sort of open this to the floor for, for broader input both comments that you may have and questions that you may have of the members of the panel. And the question I'd like to pose, uh, having noted this uh, congruence <coughs> of our thoughts around policy and, and research, is this. Do you think, uh, members of the panel, that the, the approach we have taken to conducting agriculture research is really suitable for ensuring or leading to impacts on both food security and nutritional priorities, or do we need to think about doing research differently to ensure that, that both research outcomes are appropriate and the policy derived from those outcomes makes sense? I simply leave that, and, and anyone is welcome to jump in. Victoria.
I think also the recognition that the impact need not be li limited solely on nutritional status, but there's impact all the way around, all the way down the impact pathway. That there are other important outcomes that we need to learn what those are, and not uh, and not um, give them a lesser value. For instance, the impact of some of these agricultural approaches on the status of women and the empowerment of women or the impact on other community development indicators that we're missing now. This goes back to what Victor said um, in regards to the need to have a clear conceptual framework, to have program theory-based uh, designs, and to use very clear from the beginning program impact pathways so we're not missing anything. I also, just to end, to throw something out, uh, uh, it's an interesting area uh, uh, people are now thinking about, we hear about integrating agriculture and nutrition and how the heck do you do this? Yeah. Well, it sounds really, really great. Good. If we're going to get out of our silos and integrate. The research around that, how that works, or are we actually talking about co-locating nutrition projects and agricultural projects? I think there's a whole area, a whole world of research around that. And it would seem to me there are also issues around how we actually educate scientists. Because the way PhDs are turned out is really quite different from what we're talking about when we talk about integrated science. I remember when I was working on my graduate degree, someone said what happens with a PhD is that you learn more and more about less and less until eventually you know everything about nothing. Because you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of an indictment of the PhD, but there's some truth to that because it's so narrowly defined. And so um, the research that we do is graduate. I remember my advisor saying to me, are you interested in crops or soils? I was in agronomy and I said, yes. And he said, no, no, that's not a yes and no question. <laughs> I want to channel you in one direction, then within that, you know, channel you further and eventually into this very narrowly defined area of research. Wolfgang, okay, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Well, that means what you said. I mean, we could talk about now about more multidisciplinary research and such things, but I, uh, for me it's not only a question how to uh, develop future research. The question from my perception is more how can we bring research and call it theory and practice together. In the, my environment we do, we are responsible somehow for financing international question for us is not how we contribute to these international agriculture research centers. This is somehow very easy. The question is how can we achieve that those interesting research results come on, I would say, on some fields. This is a bigger challenge. I will give you a, a, a description about the situation. Over the last decades, sorry, over the last decades, the, the amount of money which uh, went into uh, international agricultural research was slightly increasing. But at the same time, the investments in agricultural uh, production purposes were declining dramatically. There is a huge gap. And only since 2008, I feel that this gap is closing now mm -hmm. a bit. We are reflecting about possibilities how to transfer these research results to farmers. There are lots of different ways. Uh, I would say for each and every situation, a special way. You can cooperate with NGOs, with, with governments, with private sector, and so on and so forth. This is what we need to do. Probably we should support, we should do some research on, on how we can transfer these research results to practice. We have, I mean, we are already living in a, in a world, as I said, which generally does not have a problem of uh, sufficient food. We do have sufficient food in our planet in quality and quantity, but it's not so distributed as it should. And to overcome the situation, can we get about different possibilities? If we stay in so-called developing countries, then I would, or we are doing our level best currently to uh, align with other donor agencies to go in that direction. <coughs> Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Wolf. And Tim wanted to say something that I'd like to uh, encourage the members of the audience to jump in. But uh, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, um, I guess returning to your question about the connection between an agriculture intervention and nutritional outcome. Um, Eduardo Massé and colleagues had a go at looking back at the literature a couple of years ago using a, a systematic review protocol which sort of screened all of the uh, current studies against a, a very strict quality criteria. Um, and what they found was, was interesting, really. They looked at the effectiveness of a range of, of uh, interventions, biofortification, home gardens, uh, poultry and dairy development, um, and found that the studies documented well the immediate effects on productivity and consumption. But actually, when they went through to nutritional outcomes, the, 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 the conclusions were far less clear. Uh, and their conclusion, which is subtle but important, was that actually the methods that were being used in those studies, some, some of which dated back a couple of decades, actually weren't good enough to pick up those changes in nutritional outcomes uh, from the designs that were used. So we had to be very cautious. I mean, the message there wasn't that agricultural interventions had no effect on nutritional outcomes. It was, it was that the methods that were currently being used weren't of sufficient quality to, to, to pick up a, a consistent finding. So I think that, that, that was important. They put that out in the British Medical General uh, last year. And these are the method, methodological challenges you were describing. Are there are comments from the audience? The pepper. And then come to Jackie. A couple of times this morning, the, the issue of poor dietary choices were, were mentioned, and I'd like to pick up on that. Because at the same time, also we all agree that poor dietary choices are a critical aspect of uh, nutritional insecurity. Uh, our research almost entirely focuses on production side aspects. Even at ABRC, we have to we have to honestly admit that we focus on production side aspects. Uh, uh, I wonder if, we, if this needs a re radical rethink in the, in the research that we're doing and we you see what our interventions can actually affect dietary choices of consumers. Uh, even home gardens, in some sense, if I think deep about it, uh, is it essentially production or supply side intervention because we just introduce vegetables into the, in, near to the household, assuming that it increases availability and accessibility, but we don't affect the, the dietary choices of the household themselves. So it should be to go one step further, and we know it in, in the context of urbanization and, and all the advertising that's happening around the world, should we actually do research at ABRDC and, and other organizations about the dietary choices and see how we can intervene there to the office to do more research on the consumption side. Uh, Jackie, you wanted to say something? Because there's such this 
there's this historical structure of working on rice, potatoes, blah, 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 right? If we always start from that crop structured approach. So that's my continuing question for the agricultural science establishment. Is why don't we think about turning the thing on its head and starting with the demand from a human population, be they children under a thousand days or, or women who are pregnant, but defining our human populations and then doing the agricultural research that will you know, address both the biological, the crop, the soil, and the human behavioral aspects in, a, in an integrated way. And that, that's a really important point. I should tell you the rest of the story about my advisor, <laughs> because there's more to the story than that. He began by asking where I wanted to put my thesis dissertation and research emphasis. And I was funded out of a USAID to work on soybeans. I said, well, I'd like to work on a problem that will help soybeans solve the problem of, of hunger and, and, and uh, human populations and basically save the world of soybeans. He said, well, we don't do that. We do crops and so on. <laughs> seems to me is, as you say, to, to look at the, uh, the delivery of science in the interest of the beneficiary population. And so this notion of starting on the delivery side and then working backwards makes a good deal of sense. Why don't we do that? What do people think? Yes, David. Yeah, I, I'd like to follow up um, on what Jackie had said uh, with a couple of points. First of all, we, we know that agricultural research is no different to any other research in as much as perhaps only 5% of it leads to some benefit. I'd like to, um, to consider, yes, we have the, the demand, but it would be very interesting for us to look at projects that have been successful and seeing whether it were more the technology side of the project that was successful or it was the, the means of extension of that um, project that, that underlay the success. We've had many fads through the CG system, the farm, um, field schools, farm back to farmer, uh, on farm research, you name it. But it'd be very, very, I think, um, important and insightful to have a look to see uh, are we trying to propose technologies that are too complicated? Home gardens, it may sound very simple, but for people who've got nothing no idea about home gardens. It, it, it could be something that is, is completely uh, foreign to them. Or should we be looking at very simple technologies? And I, I, I don't know whether this, this is the time to, to consider this. Well, sorry for my voice as well. I think it's going to give it in a minute. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, do you have a contribution? Uh, thank you, Sarah. And again, it's related to the, to the last issue. If we look at most agricultural research, it's geared towards cutting edge research. Uh, and if we look at agricultural development, which has been driven by research, it has led largely more to monocropping or almost intensification of one crop. So, you know, we have lost the diversity at farm level at the sale. And there's very little focus indeed at all on nutrition. It's all about increasing production, increasing output, increasing profitability. And the actual amount of funding that goes into research at the nutritional level or the diversification level is very little. How would we change that? You know, that, uh, you know, that gets at the crux of the matter. When I've interacted with farmers in my former life when I was actively involved in plant breeding, the whole gist of the conversation is this is how to improve production to get more off of your land, to sell it, to make an income. It was all driven by that. It wasn't driven by the quality of what was being produced in terms of protein composition and nutritional composition. And, uh, and of course, consumers, I think, uh, look for things that are low price and good to eat. That's sort of the end of the, the, uh, the conversation. Uh, more and more we're thinking, of, I think, about nutrition and uh, health. It's not where it should be good. Tony. Thanks, David, and thanks to the panel. <coughs> um, we hear about cheap calories and profitable protein. And yet we know that's wrong. We are drawing down the world's natural capital and only doing partial accounting and just looking at the profit side of the balance sheet. And Baba Sukhdev and others and TEAB initiatives 
have shown that to us. And so in a way, food is too cheap. We can afford to throw away half of the food in Europe after it is cooked. In the developing world, 50% of it is wasted before it is cooked. So food is too cheap. And yet we see food price rise. And yet we see a reluctance for people to raise food prices. So food is too cheap. It's not to belittle families and, and poor uh, communities who don't have enough access to food. And that, that's real. But how can vegetables be that win-win situation? We can show that through full production accounting, through new natural capital approaches, through sustainable supply chain um, uh, initiatives, that, that something like vegetables can be that icon that helps transform some of our behaviors and has a win on profitability and a win on nutrition. Point well taken. Thank you, Tony. We might talk a bit more about this whole issue of behavioral change, which really gets to education and, and changing the demand side of the equation. Some of you may be familiar with the uh, recent issue in New York City. The mayor of New York said they were going to prohibit serving soft drinks, sugary soft drinks, in these huge cups. You can, you can buy one liter cups of Coca-Cola and things like that. And he said, this is ridiculous. We, don't, we shouldn't be selling sugar and empty calories in such large quantities. Let's limit the, um, the, the freedom to sell large quantities. You have to buy smaller cups. And he was roundly uh, criticized for what was clearly a, an effort to improve nutrition and, and health in the school children and population. Some schools have gone to the length of taking vending machines out so you can't buy potato chips and uh, you know, snack foods and so on. And they've been criticized for interfering with private markets and, and profitability and so on. So, and yet these are, are clearly driven by the notion that behavioral change is key to better health and provides to really confront obesity and deal with good nutritional habits with young people that we need to, we need to begin to lay out some boundaries and guidelines as to what, we, you know, what is allowable. We can do that. Can we do that in a free market economy? Can we rely entirely on education to uh, direct the choices that people make? And these are some of the central questions. What, what do you think of all this? Sure, you got one thing. Yeah. 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 Your, your example, in Germany, there is a party called the Greens. They lost elections because they proposed one vegetarian day. <laughs> <laughs> Eating them in the right amounts. 
and maybe we don't need so much research on understanding exactly why they're healthy. I think, at least for the developed world, I think it's fairly well accepted that they are a healthy part of your diet, perhaps because they keep you from eating other things that aren't so healthy. But when you look at the developing world, it's a little bit different, I think. In part because people aren't eating such large quantities of healthy foods, uh, nutritious foods. And so that then they need that dense nutrition that you can find in certain produce items more than in others. And so in that case, I think that it is really important to understand which produce items are really going to give us the best bang for our buck in terms of, of uh, improving people's nutrition. It reminds me of a conversation I had years ago with the Gates Foundation when they were trying to decide whether they were going to invest in horticulture. And the comment was, well, people don't, uh, fruits and vegetables don't contribute significantly to people's nutrition because they're not eating them. It sounded a bit like a circular <laughs> argument to me, but, um, but actually, in, in some ways, they have a point. I mean, you know, you have to eat them in order for them to be nutritious. So uh, there are, it's a complicated issue, but I think the nutrition and the density of the nutrition is important. The last thing I just wanted to mention while I had the microphone is I think it's important also to bring in the element of, of income, which I think was mentioned briefly by one of the um, that's one of the contributions that horticultural crops can bring is its income generation, which is really closely linked to food security. Uh, but that education piece on nutrition really needs to go hand in hand with that so that people hopefully will spend that income buying foods that are more nutritious. Yeah, that income, it's, it's important to remind ourselves of that if we're talking about you know, survival of farmers the income piece is, is fundamental, clearly. And vegetables offer a good pathway to a profitable online. And from our perspective, talking about nutrition and health, they offer again the, the option of improved nutrition. So it's a, it's a way of approaching both the issue of income and the issue of health at the same time, which you know, staple crops can't do as nearly as well. Victoria, you wanted to say something about that. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to come back to some of the, the points on behavior change. I think it's just really important in terms of there's just no cookie cutter approach to program design. <coughs> um, to talk about as we are now sort of sweeping generalities is the kiss of death. Mm -hmm. That whenever we're looking at programs, so especially in the countries in Africa and Asia where I'm working with Helen Keller internationally now. Is uh, very contextually specific. So really, this assessment and analysis before you get started that then defines what the program conceptual framework, program impact pathway looks like, and ensuring uh, the the formative research to inform the communication, social and behavior change strategies is undertaken. I spent my last life before joining HKI working on an infant and young child feeding project. People said you could not get mothers to exclusively breastfeed at all. Well, that is not the case. If you actually sit down with mothers and discuss what their challenges and barriers and what alternatives that they might have, that you could actually reach more often than not um, ways to have them adopt optimal behaviors. And the same thing in terms of homestead food production, complementary feeding of, of young children. But even if you get a mother to, um, uh, who's a farmer, to agree to grow certain vegetable or, or fruits or animal source foods. And uh, through behavior change, she's understanding more of the needs of her six-month child in terms of what to feed the child. She still might not be able to feed the child that because maybe your program's created more um, uh, demands on her time and she doesn't have time to feed the child. So this all goes back to, I guess, make a long story short, to do the assessment and analysis before the design of the program. So you really try and estimate the unexpected and you know what your program impact pathway looks like. And you use that to monitor the program as it is being implemented. So you see what's not working and you make those adjustments. Good. Thank you, Victoria. Tim, you wanted to say something? Yes, not so much on the um, behavioral change. Um, 
although as a vegetarian, I think that German example is not quite stretching enough for me. Uh, but um, coming back to, to Jackie and David's points um, that they made earlier, um, I mean, there's a, whole, there's a whole range of research activities, and I think it's helpful to try and sort of split some of these out. Uh, some, of the, some of the displays yesterday, particularly on the, the, the pathology stand, required deep specialist skills uh, and some sort of basic underpinning science uh, to be done that in maybe you know, 10 to 20 years' time, that will be re realized in some kind of a development impact. Um, but when we move to the translation piece, perhaps then we need to be more problem-driven and, and they're more complex, and necessarily more, more complex questions. And, and I think it's telling that in the, in the UK, the, um, the UK has decided to, to actually try to, to boost it, the productivity of its agricultural centres uh, through, through government action, and has proposed setting up a number of innovation centres. Uh, and the first cut of doing this was to cut them exactly as you said, according to discipline. So I have one, one for dairy, <laughs> I have one, one for wheat, because that's the only crop uh, we grow. And we might have one for grass, because where we don't grow wheat, we grow grass. Um, <laughs> half of the um, leadership council uh, over, overseeing this said, oh, no, 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 let's stop, let's not do that. Uh, let's define the problems that we want to solve with the research that we're trying to do the translation for, and actually set these centers up according to problems. Um, and, you know, and of course then we argued about three, three hours or so and reached out a British compromise. So um, I think it's important to realize there's different parts of this spectrum from, from fundamental research, from applied research, through to translation, through development change. And, and FBRTC has a, has a role to play in each of those. Um, but it has to be quite clear, I think, in, in, in the skills that are needed at those different stages so that we don't get a sort of a uniform, uh, a slightly mushy approach and perhaps ineffective. Approach. Well, this notion of one size fits all obviously is false, and the cookie cutter approach that you referred to is, is not the appropriate approach. So, really. um, Dino, you wanted to say something? Thanks very much indeed. Um, I'm going to try and be quick. I'm concerned that the behavior of change by humans, and I know what Tim had to say about the governments and things and the sort of dance that goes on, is driven by extreme events, not the stream flow of normal life. I think we get some of that impression from the panic created by bird flu and how that has changed. Lots of things in government, and lots of actions were taken and, and things set up, etc. Et but I haven't forgotten the man of Irishmen, that a large proportion of the Irish population was blitzed by, by Topper and Festa. Uh, and that can happen again. And we're not actually aware of the fact that out there, there are very hostile things that, by Topper's case, could blitz all potatoes, all eggplants, all tomatoes, all peppers, uh, all other solanaceae overnight. If there is some very small shift in pathogens or in a virus or whatever. That's what keeps me awake at night as PG of the World Vegetable Center. And I hope Tim also has a game plan because when the Prime Minister says to him, look, all of the orange fresh sweet potatoes are not dying, what are you going to do about it, <laughs> Professor Wheeler? Um, he's going to say to me, right, Dinah, what are you going to do about it? I need to have I need to have the defensive position, those scientists ready to be able to answer that question. And I'm not convinced that we are taking that risk sufficiently seriously today. It's never too late for late flight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Annalise? Can I just up Wait for the microphone. I was saying, um, for a non agricultural scientist, Sorry, I'm a lawyer by training. Uh, apologies for that. It's really lovely to hear the discussion about starting from the demand. Thank you, Jackie and others. However, this is the World Vegetable Center. And I just would like to, picking up on what Dan is saying, let's not forget that even if you start with the demand side, science takes time. And there are viruses, etc., that we already know have the potential to do what Diane is describing. But we can't do much about it because 
I'm afraid investments are not going in that direction already. Now, I would love to just mention the gene bank. Without the gene bank, and um, thanks to Germany, without the gene bank and what's in there, we're going to have a problem even if we do start on the demand side. So let's just not forget that even if we try to look at it from another perspective, the supply side is still very important. Right? We cannot ignore that. And then talking about policies, um, I don't know if that's policy or regulation or policy translated into regulation, but sometimes I'll give you an example from my home country, Sweden. Um, very stupid government at that point in time from that decision. Um, I think we can learn a lesson from the uh, consumption behavior in countries like Sweden, right? When we're looking at developing countries. We are buying foods that are cheap, uh, industrially produced, etc., fast to make, etc., etc., rather than vegetables, right? And then when we look at it in a country like Sweden, it is a lot cheaper to go and buy candy and cookies and, and biscuits and things like that and vegetables. Then look, let's look at the taxes. The taxes are much lower on those kind of products than vegetables. So there was actually, for nutritional and obesity, etc. reasons, a suggestion to maybe switch around the other way around. No way. Not doable. Not doable, right? So what I'm saying is that regulations like that, I believe, can actually have, we weren't able to do it, but it could have an impact. And, and maybe it's easier than to talk about oh, policy at this higher level to say, OK, we have a suggestion, a simple, straightforward regulation on, as to taxes, for example, could in, uh, encourage, actually, the consumption uh, of vegetables. Because not everybody is a farmer and can do a homestead farming. A lot of people are in urban areas, and they have to buy it. Yeah, th thank you, Annalise. So we're coming to the end of the period now. I did want to address this issue of demand-driven research, uh, because there, there are various elements that are setting those demands. We've been talking about you know, nutrition as being perhaps one of the elements of demand-driven research. Uh, Dino brought up the notion that we, we need to worry about diseases, and, and uh, there's a demand there from producers. They will demand of us that we produce disease-resistant cultivars for them to produce. Uh, and so when we think about the demand side, we, we need to get away from the notion that the only people putting demand are the consumers. There, there, there are multiple consumers. Farmers are consumers of the knowledge and the information that comes from the center. Uh, people who buy food are also consumers, and they have a, another set of demands on us. And, and that, you know, that reminds me again, going back to, as I finished graduate school, one of the first uh, jobs that I interviewed for was as a breeder with a commercial seed company. And the breeder asked me how I would design my breeding program. This is to work as a maize breeder. I said, well, I thought one of the first things I would do would be to talk to the people who buy the seed from this company to see what were the major challenges they confronted. And there was this pause, and then the guy looked at me, and he said, you know, we, we never thought about that. <laughs> uh, there's a lesson there. Um, and uh, I think we'll leave, that, uh, leave it at that. I'd like to thank again the panelists, Victoria, Tim, Wolfgang, and Victor for your contributions and all of you. Thank you.